Okay. Again, welcome everyone. This is lecture 11 in high dimensional probability and applications to data science. Today we will switch our, we'll, we'll step back a little bit and change our focus, change our viewpoint on, on what we're doing, especially the viewpoint on, on uh, random variables. And that corresponds to actually a kind of a global shift in mathematics, kind of a silent revolution in mathematics that happened uh, maybe around the, the turn of the 20th century, when instead of individual, instead of studying individual objects, mathematicians started to study their spaces, and that somehow helped. So this is kind of a shift from, from species, from individual objects, to studying their habitat. I'll explain what, what this means. For example, um, if before people were interested in properties of individual numbers, like in the 17th century, for example, 18th century, individual numbers, like is pi a rational number? Is it an algebraic number? Is E a rational number? Something like that. Then later, people's focus shifted to studying spaces of these numbers, which are fields. And probably the first example you've seen uh, of that type is, is Galois theory, uh, that instead of looking, in order to study individual numbers, the roots of uh, the, the solutions of uh, polynomial equations, it's actually beneficial to study the, the entire spaces of these numbers and their extensions. Um, similarly, instead of transformations let's say on the plane, rotations, symmetries, and so on and so forth, you can study groups of transformations. Um, and instead of polynomials, individual polynomials, you can study in algebra, we, we usually study rings of polynomials, and so on and so forth. And this is, this is you probably have had this feeling that from a big, Kind of jump was from high school, from school to the university, where things became very abstract. Um, part of this abstraction is due to the fact that, due to this rift, due to this shift from individual objects to just study of their entirety, and that somehow helps. Right? Indeed, instead of studying one person at a time, you can you understand people better if you study society generally. So, so it also happens in mathematics this way. So I'm bringing this up because. Uh, here too, sometimes it's useful instead of random variables, instead of studying individual random variables, study their spaces of random variables. So that's what we will do. We'll not go that way for very long, but it is a useful viewpoint and we will do it today and maybe in part of Wednesday. Spaces of random variables. When we study when we look at the, at, the, at the habitat of random variables, the spaces that they, um, that they live in. The relevant notion for this will be normed and Hilbert and function spaces. Most of you, maybe especially the master's students and the fourth year students already uh, know most of this material, but even, even for you, I was I'm hope, hopeful that something at least this, this viewpoint in probability would be useful to remind. But for the third year students, this may be a little bit new. So, so don't hesitate to ask questions here. Okay, Is, are there any third year students on this Zoom right now? I'm gonna ask you something. No third year student, okay. Okay, so anyway. Let me briefly remind the notions of norms, normed uh, Hilbert and function spaces, because that is what that is where we'll put our random variables in. So normed spaces first. And basically a norm is a is a notion of length. Any kind of if you if you have a vector space and you can measure, you have a ruler to measure vectors, that's a norm space. So a norm. On the linear vector space 
v is well is, is a function that that that's defined like this it's just maybe double bars and for any so it it takes us from the vector space v to r meaning that i input the vector and i and it gives me the length of that vector this notion of the length must satisfy the two the, a few natural properties for example it should be non-negative uh, length is always non-negative and it could only be zero for a zero vector if we magnify the vector five times and the length also should magnify five times so alpha the, no, the, the norm of alpha x is alpha times the norm of x except if you magnify the vector minus five times the length should be magnified not minus five but five times so i'll put absolute value here um, and the fourth and most important property is a triangular inequality which states states this so this is triangle inequality for any x and y triangle inequality Okay, guys, is this familiar? Everybody kind of heard of this before? Okay, perfect. We'll not spend too too much time on this. Just just a reminder again. Norm space is some is a is a space where you can measure lengths of vectors, and you can measure them as as an example. You can measure the lengths in most usual and natural way. That our I and hands are trained for is the Euclidean norm. On Rn, which is the sum from one to n xi squared, and then we take the square root, just like Pythagorean theorem, um, and then Rn with that Euclidean norm becomes a normed space. And I forgot to say, but a vector. If you have a norm, then the vector space with that norm is called the norm space. But, okay, so we have we have the most natural norm space, obviously. More generally, uh, we could. It's not totally obvious, but more generally, we could we could re replace this number two by any number that's bigger than one, and that becomes what is it called? LP. LP, thank you. Yes, for any P, we can look at the, the LP norm. P norm on Rn is this. LP is the sum. Xi, you put absolute value because P may be uh, an odd number. And you take the P through then. And then to distinguish the Euclid, the Euclidean norm becomes a, a partial case of LP norm. And so I'll put index two for the Euclidean norm as well. And that's, that's why in, in the homework, you've seen this index two there. So that's LP. Uh, it is even defined for P equal infinity for which, what is L infinity norm? This is maximum or supremum of all the components of mod absolute values of all the components. Exactly, exactly. So this is a maximum. In this case, it's um, there is finitely many of those n of them here. So it's maximum of the absolute values of the coordinates. So that's an LP norm. In fact, you can show that the LP norm converges to L infinity norm as p goes to infinity. Um, so it's kind of a it makes sense to, this definition of L infinite norm makes sense as a limit. This only works for P larger than one and it is not a norm for P smaller than one. For any P smaller than one. That's a P norm. Okay, good. You guys probably seen this before. Okay. Uh, this is a discrete world so far. There are just n coordinates. 
we can make the same definitions for functions in the continuous world. So same thing for P between one and infinity. We can put the LP norm for a random variable. And this is where this is getting close to our course. The LP norm of a random variable, not, not a vector in Rn anymore, but a random variable is defined similarly. And let, let's, let me think of this, let's explain. So if, you, if, you, if we have a vector, we summed up the coordinates, okay? If we have a random variable, the notion of a sum, like a metaphor for the sum would become what? Integral. Integral, it's integral or for in probability, listic sense expectation. The expectation is also kind of a, takes a general sum, normalized sum in a sense. So it's expected value of absolute value of P and then you take the square root just like this. And as P goes to infinity, this converges to the L infinity norm. Let me, let's, let's put the LP index just to, sometimes we want to distinguish between the little LP, the, uh, the vectors and random variables. So L infinity norm would become, and here, uh, we would normally put supremum because there are um, there are infinitely many values that the random variable can take. So this is supremum. Now, if you have studied measure theory already, this is a little not correct here in, because the random variables or functions they are defined up to measure zero set. So there could there could be outliers. There could be values that x takes with probability zero but still there are values and the supreme will catch them and that's not good right we want to ignore them we want to ignore what happens with probability zero and the correct notion of this um the correct way of doing this is take the essential supreme um, uh, just just as a explain what this means for example if i say that x the random variable x is bounded by some number almost surely that means that the essential supremum of X is less than M. That's, that's, that's what it is. And the best, the best bound M that they can put is called the essential supremum. Anyway, so this is, this is a minor thing. What does the LP norm capture? Well, it captures this quantity. Let's take before the taking the square, the, the P through, that's called the Peace moment, or in this case, we take absolute value. So peace absolute moment. Of X. And then the space of all random variables we, for which you can measure that, that's called LP. So LP, we, we just put all the random variables here. All random variables X. whose LP norm is finite. On the same probability space. So this way, let's say L1 becomes all random variables for which the first moment is finite, first absolute moment. And first moment is expectation. The finiteness of the first moment is expectation. So L L1 consists of all random variables with finite uh, expectations. Very natural space, right? You just look at just run the variables with, that you can talk about expectation, okay? L2 now, okay, let's see. L2, you take expected value of X squared. And what does that morally corresponds to? Expected value of x squared. Variance? Variance, right? Yeah. Like the variance is expected value of x minus mu squared. But this mu, maybe it already exists. And now we have 
uh, the expected value of x squared. So that's that's random variables. If you think a little bit about this, it's random variables with finite variance. Let's put expectation and variance. And L infinity, that's the space of random variables that are bounded almost surely. So these are the three examples where it's very natural. The spaces come up very naturally um, as assumptions. The okay, this is an abstraction, but it it kind of helps me personally sometimes to think about spaces of random variables because in because then random variables become points in space, right? So they're vectors, x, y, z, u. It kind of makes a geometric, it makes this random variables geometric objects now. These random variables may be complicated objects, but when you think of them as points in normed space, and the normed space is nothing else such as vectors, right? Vectors space, vectors for which you can measure length. So now you can think of this random variables geometrically points and that sometimes is useful it's just a geometric view you can think of these variables um, and this is let's say lp okay now, those of you who've started to study or or studied measure theory a little bit may wonder what how this relates to the classical function space op and uh, and in, in in analysis, the LP is a space of functions. It's not a space of random variables, right? but that's the same thing. Random variables are functions, and so there is no there is no contradiction here. Random variables, a random variable is actually, if you study this rigorously, a random variable is a function on on the sample space on, on or the probability space omega. And it, its expectation is the integral. So the expectation, if again, only if you've already gone that far in your study of, of measure theory, the expectation is defined this way, is defined as the integral of random variable. So these LP spaces that you study in analysis, they are actually the same as LP spaces in probability theory. Only in analysis, you talk about functions, and here we talk about random variables. But random variables are functions, so there is nothing. It's just the language is different, but the object is the same. OK, so far so good. OK, we're still going through this background. OK, the moment you look at this picture, when, where x, y, z, the random variables look like points in space or vectors in space, you may wonder what this picture really is telling us. For example, you know this may be this may be a let's, let me make a maybe a provocative picture here. So let's say x and x prime here, and maybe you can say, well, x and x prime they look really close to each other, maybe, and x and and y and x and u let's say they look very different from each other, right? How is is, is that a reality or is this is like a, know, a mirage? Can we measure angles between random variables? Right? Can we say the angles is small, the smaller the angle, the closer the random variables are to each other? Or maybe maybe if they're orthogonal, they're independent or something like that. So it's true, yeah, we can do that, but we need the notion of the angle. And the norm space do not give us that. The norm just gives us the length. It doesn't have a way of comparing vectors, vectors angles. Now, what does? What is the, the relevant notion um, in analysis and geometry that could, that allows us to measure, let's say, angles? What do you think? Correlation. Correlation, yeah, exactly. So correlation is looks like angles. And if, yes, and if we uh, look at this more geometrically, then correlation corresponds to the dot product, exactly. The dot product that we call it inner product. 
and the inner product generally so what is the what is the space called that has an inner product on it it's not norm space it's hilbert space daniel yes exactly right so hilbert spaces is exactly the, the notion where we have inner products and therefore we can measure amplitudes so that's that makes a lot of sense to um to define random variables there hilbert spaces hilbert spaces are actually a partial class an important class of norm spaces where in addition to the notion of the length you also have the, the notion of the angle and the definition that you've probably seen again but let me quickly remind it is that um, a Hilbert space let's say a real Hilbert space there are complex and real and we'll do the real a real inner product sorry a real inner product on a vector space h is a function that takes two variables which i illustrate with dots here so it takes two vectors from h x and y and returns a number r such that well the inner product with itself is always zero because that's basically the norm squared right it's always not zero it can only be zero if the vector is zero it's symmetric and it is bilinear which means that ax plus let's say bz I can factor it so it's a x y plus b z y for any x y in h a b in r okay and then if you if we have that then we have a hilbert space so hilbert space uh, is um, is a vector space with this inner product with the notion of the inner product okay so these are axioms of the inner product the important fact that it is actually a class of norm spaces whenever you have a hilbert space whenever you just have the, the notion of the inner product it automatically gives us a norm so any hilbert space is automatically a normed space uh, if we if we set the norm so how do you define the norm here remind me how do we define square root norm? square root of the x with x uh, uh, dot product of the dot of in the inner product of x with uh, inner product yeah yeah, yeah perfect yeah we call yeah dot product we call it um that's correct so but dot dot product we usually say when it's rn and and then let's say we have x1 dot y1 plus x2 dot y2 and that's how it relates so in in coordinates we say dot product but generally in front that's it doesn't matter so yeah so that's that's um that's how we define the norm perfect so far so good Okay, not going too far, too 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 fast. Sorry. No? Okay, because I'm assuming that you've kind of seen this before. All right. So example, the classical example where you do have this dot product is is Rn with the with the standard Euclidean dot product, where for two vectors you just multiply their coordinates x y y y and sum them up and then the norm becomes the sum 
with the, okay so the square root of xi with itself right so then and that is the l2 norm okay so the rn was l2 norm perfect similarly we can make the same example but in the continuous world for l capital l2 and remember capital l2 let me just show you up here so the capital l2 l L2 is random variables with finite expectation and variance, whose L2 norm is defined this way, where p equals zero. Okay. So the L2, the space of random variables with finite expectation and variance, we can put an inner product on it. And that is important because because now we have the notion of the angle between random variables, x, y, just like that. So the norm of x becomes expected value of x times x, which is x squared, one half, and that is the L2 norm, of course. Basically, this is why I wanted to talk to, to define this function spaces is that now we have now we have this beautiful picture where we can put random variables as vectors or as points in a space. And we ask ourselves, what does it mean, for example, if we see random variables that are geometrically as vectors that are orthogonal, does so that mean that they're independent or something else? So let's let's figure it out. All right, let's figure it out from the formula. Expected value of x, y. What does that look like? What does it approximately look like? <laughs> and say it should ring the bell. Expected value of x, y. Say maybe you maybe you remember what expected value of x minus mu times y, so that's expected value of x minus its expectation, y minus its expectation, something like this. What is that? Covariance. Covariance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an, exactly, that's a notion of covariance, right? And if we divide this by the norms, that will become correlation. It becomes a, by, the, by the variance, so that become correlation. So it's notion of, it, so this looks, the inner product, Looks like it become look, looks like a notion of covariance, except the expectations are not not there yet. So let's forget about expectations first. Let's let's make this let's make this connection clear. So makes let's make a Euclidean geometry, or just geometry, maybe geometry of random variables clear. And it's it's a little nuisance to have those expectations here let's forget them let's just pretend that they don't exist so we consider only the random variables with expected value zero just just to get rid of that for simplicity so we consider this the linear subspace let's say called e Cons that consists of all random variables x with expected value zero. Just to make that link clear. Is it clear that it's a linear subspace? Linear means that if you add two vectors there, then if you add two vectors in E, then the, the sum will be in E, and that's clear. And if X is in, X has expected value zero, Y has expected value zero, you add them together, well, the sum has expected value zero. So, so yeah, it's a linear subspace. Now on this subspace, What's the inner product? The inner product is expected value of x, y, and that is the covariance. Okay, that's cool. So this is covariance. Huh. Funny. 
what's the norm squared? L2 norm, obviously. That's expected value of x squared. And that is what? Variance. Exactly. And that's variance of x. And if you take the square root of that, then, well, the square root of the, then we have the norm. So the norm is a standard deviation, sigma of x. And the norm is a standard deviation. Ah. In this case, from zero, because zero is a, is a mean. So yeah, so we, what we have is, is really this picture. If, if X and Y, if we see X and Y that are orthogonal to each other, that means that the covariance is zero, the inner product is zero, the covariance is zero. And that means that these random variables are uncorrelated. Huh. So that shows us a, as a geometric notion, right? If random variables as vectors orthogonal, that means uncorrelated. Does it mean that they're independent, by the way? What do you think? No. No, yeah. Yeah, uncorrelated does not necessarily mean independence. That is true. The, yeah, let me mention this in passing. If, uh, then you may ask, right, if there is a notion where, where orthogonality would mean independence or something like that. Um, and there is one, so, but that, for that you need to go to the area that's called information geometry. And so you, you can, we can do that actually using the mutual inform the notion of mutual information. I think that that's possible to do, but not, not in an easy way. So orthogonality means uncorrelated. If we see a picture like this, let's say X and Y, what is it telling us? That the correlation is positive. Yes, the correlation the covariance is, and their covariance is positive, and therefore the correlation is positive, yeah. This inner product of these vectors is positive. So this is positively, these vectors are po positively correlated. And for example, these vectors are negatively correlated. So the angles make sense and the length makes sense. The length um, measures standard deviation from zero. So the larger the vector, the, the, the more it deviates from zero, the more random variable deviates from zero. So that makes total sense. Good, any questions about this? Good, we'll use this picture. Quite a bit. That's it's it's nice to, you know, our mind tends to compactify things. We our mind has a limited capacity, and random variables are complicated, complicated objects. So sometimes it's good to reduce them to points or vectors and think of them this way, more compactly in our brain. In order to operate successfully with this geometry, we need uh, we need some tools, and, and these are in a classical inequalities. And again, probably you've seen this all, but let me just remind you. First, Cauchy-Schwarz. Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Do we call it in, U in Ukrainian Cauchy-Schwarz or Cauchy-Bunyakovsky or maybe Cauchy-Schwarz? No? Cauchy-Bunyakovsky. Cauchy Kashi Bunikovsky, probably, yeah. I think Bunikovsky is more fair for this. But yeah, it's in, 
in the West, it's called Cauchy Schwartz yeah. for any Hilbert space. The inner product between X and Y is less than the norm of X and norm of Y. Yeah, familiar? Familiar, right? So, okay. Okay. Sure. <laughs> so for um, let's say for the particular case of random variables, what does it says? What does it say? It says that expected okay, the norm of x y, just like above, you know, the inner product x y is expected value, like this, is less than the norm of x times the norm of y. And the norm of x again from above that's variance oh the norm of x is this um, square root of the variance uh, no that's only this okay no it's just let's let's just write it classically so expected value of x squared one half expected value of y squared one half And now we can incorporate the, the, the expectations. So let's apply this, not for X, but for X minus its expectation and Y minus its expectation. On the left, so expected value of X minus expectation, Y minus expectation, that's covariance, right? So we'll have covariance on the left and variances on the right. So it's square root of the variance of X, square root of the variance of Y. So values. You remember? Perfect, okay. So then if we divide, if we divide both sides, by the right hand side by this. So what will it be covariance divided by this the, the standard deviations? What is this notion? Correlation. Correlation, exactly. So correlation between X and Y. It says the correlation is bounded by one. So it could be only between minus one and one. Which is true, in correlation. It's zero if they are uncorrelated. And the most it could be between minus one and one, in which case they're perfectly correlated, perfectly dependent on each other. So Cauchy Schwartz is one inequality that we need, we will need eventually. A more general version of Cauchy Schwartz inequality is Hilder's inequality. where we, instead of putting L2 and L2 in the right-hand side, we can put LP and LQ, where P and Q are somehow in the interplay between themselves. So it's less than or equal to XLP. YLQ, so it's a little bit more general. But of course, not for all P and Q, they have to be tied somehow. Uh, so this happens for any P and Q for which one over P plus one over Q equals one. So this is the, the connection between them. Actually, I forget. Is it correct for any P and Q greater than zero or greater than one only? Okay. I think any positive will be okay. Anybody remember this? Should be, should, should be. Probably greater than one because when it's like less than one, it's not a, a norm. Like yeah. A norm, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's why I'm asking, but I'm not sure if this automatically disqualifies the inequality from. This particular inequality. 
Yeah, so well, check it out. So for P and Q equal two, we'll, we'll get Cauchy Schwarzen equivalent. But generally, we have a bunch of them. Okay, we'll use that in the future. Um, one more inequality that we will need is Jensen's inequality, which for some reason in, in America, they say Jensen's inequality, but that's not, not the way it was pronounced originally. So Jensen's inequality, it says it's, it's very general and it holds for any convex function. So it says for any random variable X and any convex function, let's see, phi from R to R, the following holds. I can pull out the expected value through outside the feet function like that. By convex, just a reminder, by convex, we mean something like this. This way. And, and formally, by convex, we mean that if I put any two points on the graph, then this interval connecting them will be will stay above the graph and not below it. That's convexity. Good. And even more formally, mathematically, we can write it this way. This is x1, this is x2, and I can take any point in the middle, which is, let's say, tx1 plus 1 minus tx2. I just parameterize when, let's say, t is time and I'm moving, uh, and I'm moving the in, in time from, uh, from x2 to x1, that's better way. Then this point is above that point. And technically, this means that, let's see, phi of tx1 plus 1 minus tx2 is less than t1 phi of x1 plus t2 phi of x2. So here is a right hand side of this inequality, here's the left hand side of this inequality. So if you if you work out this algebraic details, that's what it says. So this is this is a definition of mathematical definition of convexity that for any t that holds. Jensen's inequality is extremely important and very, very useful in probability theory because that, frankly, that's probably the only way we can handle non-convex, uh, the only way we can pull the expected value out of uh, non-linear functions. If phi is a linear function, by the way, if phi is like, I don't know, five times x, then that is clear. Expected value is linear, so it, it, it commutes with linear transformations. But if he's nonlinear, what do you do? The only thing you can do is, is, is this, it's Jensen's inequality. It allows us to work with nonlinearities. Okay, so far so good. Okay, Jensen, Jensen. One important corollary of Jensen's inequality is that the LP norms of random variables increase in P. Let's check. So let's say we increase P and we make some, um, some numbers that's larger than P, let's say Q. So we increase P, we get Q, uh, and we want to compare the LP and LQ norm. To compare them, we will use the nonlinear function that makes from LP from LQ norm means LQ, LP norm. So it's P over Q exponent. And that function 
let's see, Q is larger than P. So this function is convex. Because, because Q is larger than P. Uh, no, wait. Q over P then. Yeah. That function is convex. And so if we apply Jensen's inequality for this random variable, for x to the p, then it says something like that, right? They can pull expected value out. Okay, and what is phi? Phi was x to the q over p. So this is expected value of x to the p, q over p. And this is expected value of, well, it's x to the p, then it's q over p. So it's expected value x to the q, that's it. And then we take the q through it and we're done. You take the cube through to both sides and we're done. LP, LP norm is less than LQ norm. So it's, in, it's increasing it. Good. So LP norms, the P, or the piece absolute moments, they increase. And so we have this hierarchy, which is kind of, should make sense on the, um, so this makes us L1. I always forget which, okay, which direction is it? This is this one. <laughs> if, if the L, we know that L2 is less than, sorry, we need L1 is less than L2. What does it say? It says that if L2 norm is finite, then L1 norm is finite. So it means that if something belongs to L2, then something belongs to L1 this way. Right, so just a reminder, these are all random variables that have the first absolute moment finite, and this is the second absolute moment finite. And because these norms increase, that happens. And so on and so forth. And maybe L3 and then and something, something, something. And at the very end of this, it's L infinity. Where random variable are bounded almost surely. And if it is bounded, of course, expected value is bounded. Okay, all right. So we have this hierarchy, which should totally make sense to you because L1 consists of all random variables with finite expectation. L2 consists of all random variables with finite expectation and variance, so smaller. And L3 is even smaller and so on and so forth. And maybe, I don't know, maybe this is, maybe this is, uh, maybe this is like an L10. And in the very last, at the very end of this hierarchy sits L infinity, the bound, all this random variables that are fully bounded, almost, almost surely bounded. And this should hold for P less than one, is it? Sorry, what do you say, Evgeny? Uh, this inequality also true for p less than one. Mm -hmm. concern, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's also true for less than one, and the reason is that this proof works for for any p and q. They don't have to be. There's no comparison with one, so it's just just positive. Yeah. Actually. I wish I remembered what L0 is. is it, so if you slide it the other way from L, L1, then L1 half, let's say L1 fourth, then what would be the limit? The L0, I can't remember. Does anybody remember what the, the limit of that is? Zero. Just. Well, there is a notion of that. There is L, LP with negative P2. Just take negative powers formally, but uh, L zero I can do. 
for discrete things, it's just like the geometric mean, right? Isn't it? Well, zero. I, I, I mean, if you if you take the discrete random variable and calculate mm -hmm. the the mean like x one plus x two, no. I mean that all the probabilities of different results are equal. Then I believe that limit is uh, limit is the geometric mean. Of the, of this. Just the mean, right? Maybe, maybe this random. What do you mean geometric? If let's let's say they they, they have their numbers. All all these values are numbers, and it's just mean. You say. By geometric mean, I mean the. Ah, geometric. Oh, ge yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like a. Yeah, x1 times x2 times x3, and then take the cubic root. That's that's geometric. Mean, for example. I see. Um, I don't. I don't think so. But, yeah, try it. It'll be surprising. I never heard of that. <laughs> tell me. Okay, tell me that's true. Um. Okay, so we have this hierarchy of random variables, and now, so before that, it's probably all all this you already know or heard somehow. But now it's an interesting question. Let me let me ask you a question. As soon as you have this hierarchy, all this L1, L2, L10 going down to L infinity, we can ask whether this this kind of chain chain of inclusions is tight, which means that L infinity is really the intersection of all these LPs. And so you, it's really like a set theoretical limit. Which, uh, if we put it in words, we can say, is it true that a random variable x, who is in the left hand side of this and what does that mean that means that all absolute moments are finite so a random variable whose all mm, all absolute moments all moments okay fine all moments are finite that's what it means well, that random variable must necessarily lie in the right hand side, and the right hand side is L infinity. And L infinity means that the random variable must necessarily be bounded almost surely. So if we see a random variable whose all moments are finite, does it mean that X? There isn't kind of an absolute bound, but X is bounded by 100, let's say, almost surely. Do you think so or not? The other way around is automatically true. Right? When the variable is bounded by, let's say, 100, then of course all absolute moments are bounded um, by that number. But uh, What's your gut feeling about this? What's your intuition? Ah, uh, someone is having a for example, I guess. Limit. I'm reading this chat from Daniel. The limit, yes. Yes. Aha, uh -huh. so this is an argument. Now I'm trying. Now I'm confused <laughs> because it looks, it looks convincing. This is an argument 
for this, it says, yeah, it will necessarily be bound. Uh, oh, I see, I see, I see. The thing is, here we are not assuming that the moments stay bounded. I'm not saying that all these moments, not saying here that the moments of random variables are all, let's say, bounded by 100. No, they could decrease. So in this example, they could increase and they'll then the infinity looks like infinity should be infinite this way. So so the, we, so Daniel, is your are you saying that it should not be true or it should be true by your argument? I think this should be true, but uh, let me think for a bit. Well, I think you're saying that it should not be true, right? Your argument says that. So let's say, um, assume that the moments are all finite, but they're increasing. Let's say the peace moment. Uh, let's say this peace moment. Let's say it equals, I don't know, 10p or something like this for any p. Well, the limit will be infinity. And the, we know the limit is. Uh, is the uh, the L infinity norm? So the L infinity norm is a limit of ten p, where p goes to infinity, and that should be infinity. So it should not be in this example. It should not be bounded. So there should be, I think. And the answer is no. So actually, there it it's not true that around the variable whose moments are finite will necessarily be bounded. The example is there. It's just staring us in front of us. It's, it's normal distribution. So example, the country example is a normal distribution uh, that does have all the, all the piece moments bounded. And it's easy to see. So how do we compute the moment? We integrate. It's an expected value of this function of a random variable. So we integrate this function against the density, the normal density, which is this. Yeah, and does that integral converge or diverge? Exponential decay against polynomial increase. So exponential will win, definitely, right? So we, it's a function with exponential, the integrand is a function of exponential decay uh, and so yeah so it converges for any p but of course x is not the normal distribution is not bounded by any number and it's not true that the normal run the middle is always smaller than 100 no there could be outliers it's spread over the entire line. Yeah. So you get it? The country example is good. Yeah. That's that's it should it bother us? It should I think it should bother us. What's going on here? It's such a nice hierarchy, L1, L2, L10, and it looks like this is a, the limit, but then there is something sitting here that we don't capture. So we don't capture the gap. So there is kind of a gap between LP for any P and L infinity, which this does not capture. There is some behavior of random variable that, this, that the classical LP spaces do not capture, the moments do not capture. And that is what we'll do next time is we'll introduce um, a new space which captures the, um, the behavior of random variable, in particular, as important ones as Gaussian, as normal. And that will be it. That will be the end of the background. Then we'll go back to study of probability. Okay. Any, any questions? Good. Okay, uh, so yeah, so this is this was a background class, and the next class will be maybe like twenty minute of background, and then we'll move forward. I'll stay a little bit longer here if you need any questions, and we'll stop recording now.